man and his mission. Dr. Bobby E. Wright was executive director of Garfield Park Comprehensive Community Mental Health Center in Chicago, Illinois. He was a husband, father, clinical psychologist, teacher, mentor, social activist, and black community leader of international stature. Dr. Wright was to assume the presidency of the Association of Black Psychologists in August 1982. The following presentation was made at the Black Psychology and Mental Health Conference at Atlanta Junior College, Atlanta, Georgia, April 10, 1980. Dr. Wright, in his own inimitable style, eloquently summarizes his principles, his philosophy, his life's mission, his hope, and his faith in the strength, inevitable triumph, and reascendancy of African people. For those who never had the opportunity to meet or hear Dr. Bobby E. Wright, this presentation will serve as an introduction to the man and his mission. For those who were fortunate enough to have known Bobby, this will be an opportunity to remember, to be re-inspired, and to be rejuvenated by their old friend. Asante Sana, Habari Ghani, brothers and sisters, uh, ladies and gentlemen. You know, sitting listening at the other two, two presentations always influences me to somewhat uh, modify mine, especially since we went through that two to the fourth of, uh, can you? We went through that two to the fourth uh, Jenny did of uh, mental health centers. My, my uh, position is the exact opposite of, of Jenny. I'm very unique, and I hate to be one of those who say I'm, I'm the only one, but I'm probably the only black in this country who is over an all-black comprehensive mental health center. There's only one we've been able to identify, and that's Garfield Park. Of the 750-some uh, centers that are in operations now that were designed in, in 1963 primarily for black people, only one in this country is an all-black center. Yet there are hundreds of all-white centers, all-white comprehensive centers. Not only is Garfield Park all black, the staff is black, and I'm in a, I'm in a community with 118,000 black people. We have approximately 96,000 face-to-face contacts per year, 96,000. So when I talk to you about behavior and all, it's coming out of some type of background because the majority of our people in Garfield Park are from Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, and places like that have southern backgrounds in, in, in the city of Chicago. Also, by the mere fact that I, I'm also unique in another way that I grew up in an all-black town, not 100 miles from here, uh, called Hopton City, Alabama, which my grandfather was one of the founders of, one of the oldest black towns uh, in this country. It doesn't have the reputation of a Mount Bayou because uh, one of the problems we had as we were growing up that we uh, always had a problem with was becoming known. Uh, we didn't want to become known, and for many years I've never wanted to become known. In fact, it's not well known, but up until, 19, up until about 1975, was well, the first time I ever consented to speak in front of a, a mixed group. In front of a mixed group. The tragedy reason I'm telling you this because I'm going to talk to you as psychology students or behavior scientists, black, because there's only one fight left, just one, and that's for the fight for the black mind, and we are losers. We are losers. You see, because if you start to think about it, some of the things I'm going to show you, and then we're going to give some solutions. Today I'm going to tell you some things that you will reject, but that we can do, and that, uh, and that we should be about doing. They're very simple things, something you can do in your day-to-day -day life. The first thing you must recognize is that as a black student, as a black student, you have uh, a responsibility that I just cannot tell you what it is. I mean, it is so awesome. But yet, you are no different than a Palestinian student. Students your age in Palestine are carrying guns and, and, uh, from uh, Palestinian students. Israeli students your age, Jew students your age are carrying guns, in addition to going to school. Carrying guns. In, ter in terms of Zimbabwe, students who also had to go to school had to carry guns. All we're asking you to do is what? Go to school. <laughs> and you are carrying guns, but against the wrong people. You're carrying guns, unfortunately, but against each other. Now, that, 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 that becomes what, we, what I deal with is the difference between what we have. By going to the University of Chicago and being trained there, and as Harold said, it's a difference between education and training. It is impossible, and I will say this to you openly, it is impossible for the Georgia school system to educate black children, mm -hmm. but they can train you in those skills we need. Your education must come from the black community and from black people. There's a difference between education and training, and that's where I want to start this off with, because a lot of people get confused about that. In Alabama, with all black teachers, they not only, they taught me how to think. Not so much what and what to think, but basically how to think. They also taught me group behavior, not individualistic behavior. Now that is what training does. Training, training teaches you to operate against the best interests of your own group. It teaches you individual behavior rather than group behavior. Education is a liberating force, a liberating force. So I'm going to go through quickly some of the things on why you should learn the skills. And nothing I say, I hope, nothing I say will imply that we are not faced with a very shrewd, very shrewd, uncompromising, dangerous enemy. Don't ever, don't ever take it in your mind that these white people are going to be easy to be had. 
It ain't going to be true. This is a hard fight. Because they have the institution and we have the people. You see, and as long as you control institutions, you can control the behavior of people. Now, with that, with that in mind, listen to, listen to it carefully. The first lesson, the very first lesson you must learn as students, is that the most, the fundamental mistake you can make is to try to use white definitions to explain or analyze black phenomena. That's the first mistake you make. And any time you use their definitions that are given to you, you're in trouble. Now, the second lesson, the second lesson I go against Harold here. I do not think you should tell your white professors nothing. I do not think you should argue with them. I don't think you should do anything. I think you should accept the skills they get and go about those. I know your black professors either. Your objective of being at Atlanta Junior College is to acquire skills and get out and go on to Morehouse and then from Morehouse on to Harvard and somewhere else. The reason you're in school is to get a degree and to get skills. Nothing else. And I'm most certainly not what I saw downstairs, playing cards and all that. That's mental style behavior. Mental style behavior. <laughs> Let me, let, me, let, me, let me tell you, let me tell you something that, that, that Mr. Gwen Rockwell and Brother Naive can tell you. They used to bring me down here every year. Uh, most of the time I had to pay my way, but they still brought me. Uh, they used to bring me down every year to talk to the combined uh, students over at uh, Morehouse, AU, and all like that. And in bed, look at all these black students. Oh, Dr. Wright, we crazy about you. Why don't you come south and take over these schools? You know what I used to tell them, and I say this clearly. I have a great deal of admiration for these black teachers working in these schools. I, you know, you think I have it bad in the middle health center. At least I know I'm dealing with people who are crazy. I mean, you know, at least I know that. You know what I mean? I just realized that. You know, I mean, I'm out of know I don't mean that to be funny. I really don't mean that to be funny. Believe me. I know a lot of students, students have come to me now and say, hey, we read your stuff now. But let me tell you something. If I came to Atlanta and took over school, the first day here, I would send half the black students home. Half the black students would go home. I really, and, I, I would, and it wouldn't be hard for me to find out who I was going to send home. Well, just walk through the halls and do things. I know exactly who's going home. Right then. The second day, I was going to have the black faculty home. Yes. You see what I'm <laughs> The third day, I sent all the black administrators home. Oh, you know, uh, 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 uh. And, and then we'll be about the business of, of teaching. Because I swear, I see people, I see students doing stuff to black people, black adults I've never seen before. I'm very serious about this. Okay, let's go through it. Here's what we're going to go through. I'm going to go through with you something you might not have seen before. But every time, by being over this very large agency, we have, and by the way, we train AU students. We train students until we give them our field placement. We give uh, the internships to people from the Harry. We train them. We give uh, from Howard University. A uh, train at Garfield Park. We train uh, people. But one of the things that happen invariably is that you students, the students come in and say, yeah, Bobby, uh, fraud is nothing. Young ain't had it, never had, da, da, da. And I said, fine. And they're not relevant to the black experience. I said, can you tell me why? Let me show you why. Uh, from Howard University. A uh, train at Garfield Park. We train uh, people. But one of the things that happen invariably is that you students, the students come in and say, yeah, Bobby, uh, fraud is nothing, young, ain't had it, never had, da-da-da. And I said, fine. And they're not relevant to the black experience. I said, can you tell me why? Let me show you why. Yeah. Uh, I'm just going to take some random because these are what I call mental style programs. These are mental style theories. These are mental style modalities. And invariably, what you try to do is take these and treat black people. And it never works. Remember, remember, the ultimate objective of mental health in this country is to get black folks to adjust, to adjust. Some of the thickest black people I know, remember, I do not call people niggas. I do not call them toms. I never use that word. I never use that word, and you shouldn't. That's the first thing you should stop and just throw it out of your vocabulary. Throw it out of your vocabulary. We, are, we have a right to have sick people like everybody else. And we should begin to differentiate between what's appropriate behavior and inappropriate behavior without getting into the name calling and all like that. Now, it's to adjust, and remember, remember the definitional, I told you, remember that definitional warning I told you. Let's take a theory. Let's take a theory of uh, Maslow. All of you agree with Maslow, because black blanket, I'm sure where else to go from, dog go. Maslow had a theory called self-actualization. So all you remember, okay, first you have to fulfill, here's the, here's the, here's the way it's the model. This is the model. Uh, first, food, water, sex, and sex here is the appropriation of the species. These basic needs must be met first. This is Maslow, but you all are trained, many of you are trained, because uh, from this came transactional analysis, came curls. I'll go into it in a minute. Uh, the next one is safety. That's the next level. Safety. That's the next level. The third level, the third level is self-esteem. Fourth level is love. And then self-actualization. That's the Maslow model. Give or take a line. That's the math model. Right away.
way. You should see clearly here. You should clearly, clearly if you try to apply, no matter how good it sounds, this theory to the black experience of the trying to treat black right away. We have a problem getting food and water. That doesn't give you a problem. Yeah, but <laughs> wait, 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 no, 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 we have problems all three of these. Let me tell you why we have all three of these. Now remember, these are the hierarchy of needs. Maslow takes the position that in order to be a healthy functioning individual, you must have, you must secure these needs and go here. A hierarchy of needs must be met. If that is true, we ain't never been safe in this country. <laughs> if that be true, if that be true, you can see right away, and I'm not teaching you all this so that you can go up and tell your professor that. What I'm saying to you is just the way you do analysis. But in order to do analysis, you must first know it. You cannot analyze something you don't know. And we've been in this country 400 years and know nothing about it. That's a tragedy. That's a myth of fact. That is the, that's, and I'll talk about just a little bit about it. Okay, now, then, so what, look at what else Maslow said. He said, no, if you cannot do these things, most certainly cannot have self-esteem. And without self-esteem, you cannot what? Love. Now, let me, let me show you here. Sex. What was called procreation. How all of this ties in it. No, out of this, of course. Out of this, what you call sort of non-directed counseling. Came French pearls that all y'all have on your wall. I'm not in this world to satisfy you. You're not in this world to satisfy me. You do your thing. I do mine. And we have to call somewhere beautiful. You know, that same old BS they got us all doing. This individual just, you don't tell me what to do. I don't tell you what you can do. You know. And all of that. And we're the only people that engage in that type of behavior. We're the freest people in this country in that respect. But we individuals. You can do anything you want to, and the black community cannot sanction you. In one sense, we're the freest people in this country. No Jew can do anything he wants to against the Jews. No Irish can do anything he wants to get up But any black can get up here and say and do anything they want to and we cannot sanction them. Speak that in mind. What I'm talking about, and I'm going, I'm going, like I said, we have to go. Because I know we got a lot of questions. Uh, now, the second now becomes a problem here. Because, as you know, many of you have heard me talk about this day, but you should understand this. Today, in 1980, the group with the largest suicide rate in the nation, a young black male, 17 to 33. Largest suicide group. The group with the largest suicide level. The group with the largest homicide rate. Young black males, 17 to 33, killing themselves. Killing each other. The group with the largest institutional rate. I mean, going into mental hospital and the prison. Young black males, 17 to 33. Now, let me tell you the significance of that. The significance of that is this. The significance of, of that, well, let me go one step up. Now, when you raise the question of homosexuality, which means you're now also talking about the ratio of what? Males, black males to black females. Sex become now a problem here now. Well, even, and I'm talking about the way they use it for procreation, for procreational purposes. And if we look at some of the, if we look at some of the, uh, some of the statistics about that, which I, uh, at, at 14 and under, at age 14 and under in the black community, for every 100 black females, there are 102 black males from 14 and under. At the age of 14 and under, for every 100 female, black females, there are 102 black males. However, from the ages 14 to 24, for every 100 black females, you have 96 males. And then from 25 to 44, for every 100 females, you have 84 black males. 84 black males. Now, when you take into account the institutional rate alone, for example, let me give you an example of that. For every 100,000 black men, for every 100,000 white men, 105 in prison. Every 100,000 white men, 105 in prison. For every 100,000 black men, 1,004 in prison. 1,004. For every 100,000 black men, yet we are less than 15% of the population. All right. Now, if you begin to look at those ratios, then you have to project during the child-bearing ages, how many functional black men are there for each 100 black women? And you run into some statistics of, say, less than 55. Less than 55. Now, given this reality, given this reality, these are the type of problems I'm saying to you that you as a student must begin to, let's, let's look at those things again. So what they say is okay. Here's what they're saying now to us. They're saying, those of you who are making it, those of you who have PhD from the University of Chicago and the head of Mental Health Center, you got it made. It's a class struggle now. Class. And that came from, what did we all know, what they kept. See what happened in the 60s. Why we lost the battle in the 60s. Why you never hear nobody talk about the 70s. How many of you people here talk about the 70s? Nobody. Everybody's a boy in the 60s. And here we are in the 80s. You know, they, 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 nobody talks. Because in the 70s, those whites regrouped and wiped us out. You see, here's what happened. White women saw their men in trouble. And like all female animals, anytime the male gets in trouble, the female will attack. 
That is a law of nature. A law of nature. If you don't believe it, we can prove it in a zoo anytime you want to. <laughs> Now, what happened, white women came out and captured our women and convinced us that white women were not as racist as white men and convinced us, or convinced our women, that they would place them above their husbands, their brothers, their lovers, their children, their sons, and we Then the white gays came out and convinced our gays it was a gay struggle <laughs> and stole our gays, you know, okay? White students came out and grabbed our black students, said it was a student struggle and wiped out our black students. And all of a sudden, we have to wonder, where's the fight? You know what I mean? You know, it, it, it's not about... So now they're coming up with books such as Book of the Declining Significance of Race. Brother named Wilson wrote that book, who is the chairperson of the Department of Sociology at the University of Chicago. That's very revealing. Because out of that same department came who came who? Black bourgeoisie. E. Franklin Frazier in 1939. That is the Chicago school where you show so what, what, what Wilson is saying, this brother wrote this book, The Decline in Significance of the Race. The race is declining in significance, and now class becomes important. Of course, Wilson is the only black in the Department of Sociology at the University of Chicago. That's one reality. The other reality, he has a white wife. Oh. Now, race declines every night for him. You know, <laughs> look, I mean, that's what it's all about. <laughs> That's what all these conferences should let me back and keep that in mind. The only reason I go around the country is to begin to develop a black social theory. A black social theory. Now, we, this is the problem we have. Why we have all this problem? Because one of the things that have happened to your generation that didn't happen to me and to everybody else who's at my age is when I was growing up, the black community rewarded those people who tried to get an education. Rewarded them. Now we are anti-intellectual, anti-educational, and completely historical. Don't pay any attention to history. So what they do to us is our brightest black men. Look, these are our brightest brothers and sisters. They grab through their social theories. One is called Marxism. Marxism. That's the danger to all our black people. That's class theory. Class. Now listen. Let's talk about. Let's do Marx just like we did Maslow. Let's do it quickly. Marx said basically there are two classes of people. The one he calls what? The ruling class. And the bourgeoisie. The other he calls the what? Proletariat. Proletariat. Two classes. And the relationship to these two classes is the production of what? Means of production. This relationship. And the ruling class' sole reason to exist is for profit. Profit. And in order to make more profit, they would have to exploit this group of people. Marx went even farther. He said, just by time, time alone, you don't need any intervention. Just time alone means that also the proletariat would have to overthrow the ruling class in order to survive. Because the more profit the ruling class wanted, the, uh, made, the more they would want, the more exploitation of the class. And, but he said something else. He said that if you had people who understood the science of capital, the science of the, what he was talking about Marxism, you could then raise the contradiction, artificially raise the contradiction between them. That's the word raising the contradiction came about. Those slogans that the Panthers used and didn't understand. Then you could raise the contradiction between these two groups and induce revolution. Ah, see, Marx lived in 1848. <laughs> and Marx didn't know that this proletariat here was going to see called what? Union. And that's what unions are for. Profit. <laughs> <laughs> so you got two damn group of white folks fighting over profit. <laughs> okay, now, blacks are not in the ruling class or in the union, believe it or not. The blacks are what Marx called what? The lumping proletariat. Now, the Panthers, and I'm not just thinking about Panthers, many of them are my students who are opted to uh, not stay in the struggle for race and did it for class and ass. But, uh, 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 the, the thing about this, the thing about this here is that what even the, even the Panthers start calling us what? Lumping. The lumping proletariat. Forget what Marx said about the lumping proletariat. Marx stated that the lumping proletariat was not a potential revolutionary force. So even Marx said that. So because they're what? They're not mean, they're not called the means of what? Production. So if we, so if you admit that we are lumping proletariat, you cannot say you're a Marxist. Not as a black person, unless you need my professional service. <laughs> you think, I mean, yes, we can't do that. We can, we can. I tell you, we know Naeem and I, we got this thing going. I always say, the one contradiction in the black community, and I'm very serious about this. I know stuff I sound, say sound funny, I'm very serious about it, is that we have no contradictions. That's the one contradiction. There are no contradictions in the black community. And that is because, again, the thing I'm talking about, 
Mr. Sire, let me, let me move, move on here. Okay, so that takes the amount. Okay, uh, <laughs> uh, let, let's, talk, let's talk about fraud just for a minute. Uh, see, see, fraud, uh, I think you all should study fraud. Study fraud, because see, fraud took the position that there were differences between black and white. And he didn't put no, no type of value on it. He put the value on the Europeans. Here's what fraud says. It says it clearly. Read them clearly. He said that the white race, and he was very clear about it, very clear, the Europeans, he wrote it very clear. And he had wrote all about Africans, that Africans seem to have a different type of personality. He said the Europeans are motivated by two genetically determined, irrational drives. Namely, sexuality, sexuality, and aggression. Which he called the death instinct and the life instinct, and comes about. And Marx said, since these, th since these are genetically determined traits, that they have two genetically determined traits, sexuality and aggression, that society had to be developed in order to set certain rules, in order to set certain type of conditions to keep these two natural drives, natural drives of whites, from spontaneous, do what? From spontaneous, spontaneous expressing themselves, therefore threatening the light, the, the, the uh, threatening the species. You go that clearly. And that is why if you do, if you try to expose black folks to analysis, analysis really means that we meant you have to, see it's only about four things you can do to person in third. Just as long as you want to go on, I hope you do. So this is fight for the mind. I'm just giving you the, that's about four things here. One thing you can do for blacks in a, in a mental health center, anywhere else in here in this room, is that you can leave them alone. I mean that's the first thing. And men ought to be better left alone. So, you know, better left, leave alone. That's the thing you can do however is to do what? Give them support. Give them very support. Give them support in such a way because what they're doing is needs certain of your professional skills to, to give them support. The third thing you can do, of course, is you can re-educate. You can re-educate re means that they're, 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 they're learning talent. The way they address themselves to their life is, you know, is, uh, is inappropriate and you, you re-educate. The fourth thing is possibly you might be able to do, and that's what Freudian psychology came in, psychoanalysis, is completely restructure the personality. Literally give the person a new personality. And so, uh, so Freud took the position that Europeans would have to be sent through psychoanalysis in order to try to, to contain these natural drives. Now, right away, you don't have to be no genius to understand that these are natural drives, how difficult it is. So when you see what, 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 what Harold was talking about, it's somewhat an error. This is what is so difficult. See, what you are and all of us could fail to believe is there's some inconsistency with white people's theory and their practice. It is really not. It is really not. Now we get to your other one at all of you. Okay, that's Freudian. You can question me and get that. That's Freudian psychology. You learn it well enough and get a PhD in, in, in almost any country, in, in any university in this country. If you learn it well enough. If you learn it well enough. The whole process of getting through universities in this country is expended effort. <laughs> expended effort. Listen, that's all. At medical school, it's easy. Everybody's raving over more houses in medical school. Do you know what a black doctor does? He's a slave. Our black doctors are some of the most dysfunctional people you want to see. They never come out of those clinics. They come into their offices every day here, 200 women, a gynecologist. Get 200 sisters looking at them. And believe it or not, they do not treat those, they do not treat those, those illnesses that they claim they treat the sisters. And you can, I'm just showing you, this is another lesson. I'm, I'm, I'm off Martin, now. I'm going, in. I'm going in to talk to you about medicine. The next time you go to your physician, do this for me. Watch and see how they follow this family. First, they take you in a little room and you begin to get ready, be prepped by a nurse for the doctor. And you can hear him coming. Literally hear him coming towards you. And the most he spent with anybody is 10 minutes, if that. And if he comes in, he's going through his bed, how are you? You knew what else you did. <laughs> I mean, you know, oh, this, that, and that, and this, and that. And all the time touching you and feeling you and oh yeah, you know, and writing the same prescription for you he wrote for the flat other side. But let me tell you, what he's doing, he's treating the person. But that's very important. Because there's no way, if you stop to think about it, there's no way anyone, if you see one medical book, that's it. It's impossible to comprehend everything in that one book. But you see, what, my point I'm telling you as students, don't let that deter you. If you get, and can think at all, you need two things to get to medical school. Two things. You need the capacity to study and a good memory. The capacity to sit for long periods of time and read garbage. And regurgitate it. That's all. That's all that's all medical school. In fact, medical school to me is the easiest school. 
psychology, if you really, let me tell you about psychology, I'm going to go on if you all don't know. Let me just go through some of my experience. One time I walked into a clinic, and I did my training at the University of Chicago Medical School. I walked into this room, and brother sitting there, this is over 10 years ago, brother sitting there, hooked up to a machine. I mean, I hooked up from the head, like somebody from Mars. Hooked up. And, you know, and I looked at him, and he looked at me, and, uh, and the nurse was sitting there, uh, because it was in intensive care. I said, what the hell? You know, uh, but well, I, I thought I knew everything about the brain, you know, me and my arrogant self. So I thought I knew everything about the brain, like many of you. Think you know everything there is know at 18. So, uh, you know, uh, and so, you know, and so what happened was, this was, this was electrical stimulation of the brain. That's how I stumbled into the electrical stimulation, just stumbled in there. I've been reading about it. I knew almost everything about it, but when I saw it, I didn't recognize it. That's my only point. The other thing is that, uh, I'm just showing you what psychology is not what you all think it is. It's not giving CPM. There's another guy named Osgood. You're right on off. It's very important now. Osgood did a lot of work with computers. But he came up with a theory called this, called grit. They call it grit at the Pentagon. Graduated from physical initiative attention reduction. What Osgood has done, what Osgood, and it is, he's, been done it, 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 he's done it a long time ago, but what he has done, he decided to develop to treat countries like you do a personality, like you do an individual. That treat the entire country like you do an individual. And the Pentagon uses it. What this means is graduate reciprocal initiative. It means what they're doing with Iran right now. What they're doing with Iran right now, it follows Osgood law. It's a psychology. Develop that. That's a psychology. Then we have, of course, which I think is probably one of the most, one of the five most dangerous crafts in the world. That's Kenner. 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 <laughs> he wrote these eight words, and listen to them carefully, right now, and look at it, every one. Those are eight more profound words. They scattered the behavior shaped and maintained by consequences. Listen carefully. That's why he wrote Beyond Freedom and Dignity. What the young freedom and dignity did was that was all of these black folks are talking about they want freedom and they want dignity and you listen to them carefully. We can give them what they want and still control them. In other words, that they will induce blacks to begin to do birth control, become sterile, sterilized by making the consequences minor. Minor. By saying to black people, if you do this, if you become sterilized at a certain age, we will give you so much money. We'll give you so much money. Now don't, don't argue that because see, something I think, uh, again, we are, we are led to believe. We have been led to believe, and this is what a mental side. The mental side is those who got it on the wall around it. And uh, when I walk down the hall, don't identify me. Don't say, hey, Bobby, because I want these white folks to know that my name is on that wall that y'all got around here. Uh, uh, mental side is defined as the, system, the deliberate and systematic destruction of a group's mind with the ultimate aim, the ultimate objective being the extirpation or the extermination of that group. That's mental side. This deliberate and systematic destruction of a group's mind. A group's mind. But the ultimate objective being the extermination of that group. And so if you begin to look at what's going and all of these, and I'm talking to you all because most of you are psychologists too, this is what psychology really means. Anytime you see things on TV, psychology, I've had something to do with it in terms of advertising. Anytime you see those projections on who's going to win an election, the moment that CBS at 6 o'clock and CBS at the polls close, psychology works out those statistical formulas. See, uh, back in uh, 1925, um, uh, what's his name, who was uh, one of the first behaviorists who they caught um, on, a de on the top of a desk with a student um, and, and, and fired him. Uh, what's his name? He said, give me, any, give me any student, any child, and I'll make it whatever I want. Watson, who was the first victim. Watson, when they fired him from the University of Chicago, what Watson did when they started J. Walker Thompson, advertising agent, a psychologist. He became the largest in the world. You see, I'm saying to you that when you start talking about psychologists, it's one thing you might hear this narrow thing here at junior college. It's another thing all the others were white. It was a psychologist who started it, what is now the CIA. Only it was called then OSS in the Second World War. Before the Second World War, the United States didn't have that type of arm, that type of intelligence arm. I'm just showing you that what, what, how much you have to learn. And don't let anybody fool you and just feel you in that it's irrelevant. Because you're talking about people's minds. You're talking about influencing people. In fact, you're talking about determining their very existence. And as Harold said, I said, yes, I do say that. If you control minds, you control behind. I don't know what people say. And so, one of the problems we have, and, and, move, and moving on to this, let me, let me just give you a couple other things that you should look at. Um, 
about this. Now, if we look, if we look at a student, or we look at a university, it becomes very clear, Atlanta University, Atlanta Junior College system, is, that one of the realities is our condition. And this is where blacks sort of get confused, this is where we get confused. Our true condition, one of our true conditions is oppression, exploited, women are exploited, da 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 da. No, 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 no. We are what? Enslaved. 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 And the reason we're enslaved is because all of our life sustaining institutions are controlled by whites. That's slavery. That's slavery. I will guarantee you, there's nobody in this room can tell me where, the, oh, where you turn your water on at. Or where you turn your lights off at. I ain't talking about in your house. Because <laughs> they can turn your lights off without even coming in your house. All of our life sustaining institutions are controlled by another group. That is slavery. That is slavery. Now, I'm not telling you all, you all of this to, to depress you. You know what I mean? You know, I'm talking about because you keep hearing this type of stuff and I, mean, I believe that we are stronger than other group of people. Well, we have been led to believe that we are super people. We're not super people. We are simply just not utilizing, utilizing the appropriate methods to address this problem. Most of the time they get us because we personalize. We personalize because we have a, good, a white friend. Uh, what are you talking about? Whites treat me better than blacks. Why they ripped off my TV last night. <laughs> you know, uh, 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 we equate ripping off a TV with ripping off your mother. You know, now, let me give you an example. I was just talking about it, but this might be the first time y'all have heard it, but I was at the uh, social workers' convention Friday in Washington. Some of us were here. Some of the students were here, too, from here. And I was pointing out that on the plane, the day before that, a sister I talked to some black students in Chicago, and a student had pointed out that a sister stood up and said, well, you